Good afternoon and welcome to the 101st of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, in a continuation of my discussion from last week on COVID-19, nuclear violence, and radiation, I talk with psychiatrist and author Robert J. Lifton. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for guests and future topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, August 10th, 2020, there are 19,919,559 confirmed COVID-19 deaths, excuse me, confirmed COVID-19 cases globally. Let me try that again, 19,919,559 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. That's up from 19,189,737 cases reported Friday. Of those, 5,058,564 in the United States, and that's up from 4,917,050 reported on Friday, there are now a total of 163,100 deaths from COVID-19 reported in the United States. That's up from 160,702 reported on Friday. We're still at a pace of over 1,000 deaths a day in the United States. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for COVID-19 sufferers every day. I'd like to continue that now. I'm going to read today, actually, is part of the text of a peace declaration which was read by the mayor of Nagasaki, Japan, Tomohisa Tawe, which was read at a ceremony to mark the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Nagasaki, which was 75 years ago yesterday. And so these are the words of the mayor of Nagasaki. Exactly 75 years have passed since the day our city was assaulted by a nuclear bomb. Despite the passing of three quarters of a century, we are still living in a world where nuclear weapons exist. Just why is it that we humans are still unable to rid ourselves of nuclear weapons? Are we truly unable to abandon these dreadful weapons that so cruelly take lives without even allowing for dignified deaths and force people to suffer for entire lifetimes as a result of radiation? Songwriter Kino Fumio lost his wife and children to the atomic bomb on that August 9th, 75 years ago and went on to express his sadness and feelings about peace through music. In his memoirs, he wrote the following. Again, this is related by the mayor of Nagasaki yesterday. The tragedy that unfolded beneath the reddish black mushroom cloud that spread out on that day is deeply embedded in my heart. The awful sight of hideously burned people covered in flames, innumerable corpses scorched until they were almost carbonized and spread around the debris like logs, women wandering about with leaden eyes, Phantasmagoric visions such as this vividly revisit my mind as the day of August 9th comes around each year. The mayor continued, in order to see that no one else ever goes through such a hellish experience, the Hibaksha or atomic bombing survivors have fervently striven to inform us about what went on underneath that mushroom cloud. However, the true horror of nuclear weapons has not yet been adequately conveyed to the world at large. If, as with the novel coronavirus, which we did not fear it, until it began spreading among our immediate surroundings, humanity does not become aware of the threat of nuclear weapons until they're used again, we will find ourselves in an irrevocable predicament. There are innumerable ways that we can become involved in working for peace. This year, many people have been applauding the continued efforts by those in the medical profession to battle the novel coronavirus. In the same way, let us now applaud with heartfelt respect and gratitude the Hibaksha who, while enduring physical and mental pain, have spoken out about their painful experiences for the 75 years since the time of the atomic bombing until today in order to provide a warning to people around the world. With this applause, we're able to spread the circle of peace. Young people of the world, 
novel coronavirus disease, global warming, and the problem of nuclear weapons share one thing in common, and that is that they affect all of us who live on this earth. Are nuclear weapons necessary for the world of the future that you will live in? Let us clear a path to a world free of nuclear weapons and walk down it together. I appeal to the leaders of countries around the world. Along with everyone who reluctantly could not attend today's ceremony, again, this was a ceremony held yesterday in Nagasaki because of the novel coronavirus, we offer our heartfelt prayers for those who lost their lives to the atomic bomb. And hereby declare that Nagasaki will continue to work tirelessly with Hiroshima, Okinawa, and all the people in places where great losses of life were experienced due to war and where peace is longed for. And where peace is longed for in order to bring about eternal peace and the elimination of nuclear weapons. I'd like to bring on my guest for today, and it's uh, as we start uh, today being the 101st COVID calls, I cannot think of a better guest to start uh, this new round of conversation. So I'm just really honored he would come on and have this conversation today. Let me introduce you to Robert J. Lifton. Robert J. Lifton graduated New York Medical College in 1948. He's credited with helping to establish a new field of medicine called psychohistory, a field of inquiry that explores the psychological motives of individuals and groups of historical actors, as well as the psychological impact of historical events. He's a recipient of the Gandhi Peace Award, the Holocaust Memorial Award, and numerous other international awards, national and international awards, as, men, as well as many honorary degrees. He's published many books, uh, one that is essential reading for everyone, and one of my favorite books, Death in Life, Survivors of Hiroshima, which won a National Book Award. He's also co-author with Greg Mitchell of Hiroshima in America, A Half Century of Denial, The Nazi Doctors, Medical Killing and the Psychology of Genocide, Witness to an Extreme Century, a memoir, more recently, The Climate Swerve, Reflections on Mind, Hope, and Survival, and just last year with the new press, Losing Reality on Cults, Cultism, and the Mindset of Political and Religious Zealotry. Robert, thank you so much for making time. It's great to see you today. I'm happy to be with you, Scott. So I'd like to remind everybody you can get your questions in. Just put them into the chat in YouTube Live, or you can put them up directly uh, on Twitter, just be sure to tag me at US of Disaster when you do that. Robert, I've been starting all of these conversations just by asking people where they're calling in from and what the COVID-19 situation is there. So I'd just like to start with that. Where are you and, and how's it looking there right now? Well, <clears throat> I'm speaking to you from Wellfleet, Massachusetts, which is on lower Cape Cod. Uh, and I've had a home here for, well, more than 50 years. I've spent usually in recent years about half of my time here and half in New York. And because of the COVID threat, I've moved here uh, into the indefinite future together with my partner. Uh, so I see myself as living in New York and Massachusetts, but I seem to be here in Massachusetts for the foreseeable future. Uh, and, uh, you know, it isn't that uh, the state of Massachusetts is free from uh, COVID-19 worries. It's got its own in many ways. Uh, the Cape here is, is a rural place, but uh, so in some ways it's an advantage, but I would emphasize that it's in the nature of this virus that no one is absolutely safe. Uh, uh, we we don't understand enough of it to make that kind of statement. So this is where I am, uh, and this is my present moment. So we've just passed the 75th anniversary yesterday, uh, two anniversaries, 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Very important days, important to remember. And I wanted to ask you first, as we move into our conversation, um, how you usually mark those days, how you've seen those anniversaries change over time? Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, that's a good question. I've always been aware of Hiroshima Day because Hiroshima has this profound meaning for me in my life personally. 
the way that I've usually uh, uh, commemorated it is to go to a very small vigil uh, at uh, Wellfleet, which uh, at Wellfleet Center, right in front of Town Hall. But sadly, the vigil was called off, even though it's small and outdoors because of COVID-19 this year. Uh, but I'm always aware of the day and I'm in touch with uh, friends and colleagues and tend to in some way bring my work again out about Hiroshima or uh, in related ways to express my sentiment on that day. Always with the assumption that Hiroshima still has importance for us. You wrote Death in Life, Survivors of Hiroshima, and I believe it was it was published in 1968 and won the National Book Award in 1969. I believe if I've got my the numbers right, and was re-released in 1990 in the 1990s as well. Um, just a really crucial book, and I, I guess um, I want to ask you kind of a broad question about it. Why did you write that book? Why were you moved to take on this topic, and what was the challenge of doing the study? It's usually assumed that I did the study in Hiroshima and thereby became anti-nuclear. Actually, I went to Hiroshima because I was anti-nuclear. Uh, I had been in Japan completing a study of Japanese youth from the standpoint of psychology and history. And I was about to go back to the United States to uh, take up a chair that had been given to me at Yale. Uh, and I was, I thought I would like to stop in at Hiroshima, manage to go to that city in order to uh, experience what it was like. This was 17 years after the dropping of the bomb. And the first thing I learned about Hiroshima was that nobody had studied it. Here was uh, one of the most disturbing events in human history, and no one had done anything close to a comprehensive study of that event or of that city. Uh, there were reasons for that. Japanese had come and had done partial studies, but had understandably been preoccupied with helping people, uh, and for various reasons, uh, no overall study had been attempted. Uh, I was able to uh, stay in that city, make arrangements with my university, uh, and first begin to talk to people at great length about what had happened to the city, and then finally systematically initiate a series of interviews with a standing protocol uh, in what I took to be uh, a, a scientific interview study. So. Uh, the first finding came to me before I had uh, really done uh, a, a depth interview with any Hiroshima survivor. I came to a kind of conclusion that um, mm -hmm. it's only a little bit exaggerated to say that the more important an event is, the less likely it is to be studied, at least in a very mm -hmm. large, uh, inclusive way. And for, there are reasons for that. It's very hard to study a large event. You have to modify your approach. You can't use your standard professional approach. And it also uh, can be uh, difficult to uh, in any way uh, confront something so large. So model for studying an event this large, though one does have to bring uh, one's professional knowledge and experience so in the process of Hiroshima, I had to evolve or extend a model I had begun to use uh, in this psychohistorical work. I begun in my earlier study in Hong Kong of Chinese thought reform. In any case, uh, I did embark upon the study and lived in Hiroshima to do that study uh, in the spring and summer of 1960. I visited uh, Hiroshima for the first time in 2015 after having 
read and studied it throughout college and, and graduate school. And even then, you know, I'm having trouble. Uh, I was, I was overwhelmed by the experience. And I wonder if you could say, I mean, what did the city, you said you were there 17 years after the bombing, but it, at that time, the peace memorial was, was not even open or was just opening. I mean, it was still a city that was shaking off even still the physical impacts, not to mention the psychological impacts, right? Well, the city was kind of a, a mixture. It had been in many ways physically rebuilt and it's an attractive city, as anyone knows when he or she goes there. But at the same time, yes, there were residual evidences of the weapon. Uh, and more than even the physical evidences, uh, there was everywhere uh, uh, evidence psychologically in talking to people uh, about what had happened 17 years before. Hiroshima had become more the world's model than Nagasaki, and Nagasaki could justifiably often consider itself relatively ignored. But Hiroshima was the first uh, city on which to have uh, a nuclear weapon dropped on a, an exposed population. Uh, and as the first, uh, it, uh, it, in a sense, became the locus for world concern about it. So the city was a mixture between a kind of attractive newness and residual effects uh, of physical ethics of the bomb, but also greatly of psychological effects once one began to talk to people who had been exposed to it. The process of getting the interviews, I've always been curious and never had a chance to ask you. It, it must have been quite challenging to gain trust. Uh, I mean, especially considering the refusal of the Japanese government and the, the American government as well to tamp down the realities of Hiroshima. I, I've always wondered how you gained the trust of people to participate. Um, arranging, you know that in any research, something like 70 or 80 percent of one's time is uh, is taken with making the arrangements and the other uh, 20 or 30 percent perhaps with carrying through the work or the interviews. In this case, my situation was in a way Kafka-esque. Here I was coming to Hiroshima, uh, a citizen of the country that had dropped the weapon on that city, uh, the most uh, the cruelest weapon in human history, as I called it, uh, and others as well, and asking people how they felt about it. Uh, I went about the work in uh, this way. I divided the people I interviewed into two categories. The first were leaders in the city who had themselves been hibaksha or survivors, uh, and they could be religious or political or um, uh, occupational leaders, uh, they, they could be uh, people who had emerged in what became thought of in disaster literature as emergent leaders in relation to Hiroshima, and a second group of people who was chosen at random from the lists of survivors that were kept at the medical school. Uh, and. Mm -hmm. uh, in the second group, of course, as I took every 50th name from that list, uh, it was inevitably mostly poor people whom I uh, actually sought to interview. But in order to show them respect, I went out on the streets of Hiroshima together with my interpreter and with a Japanese social worker who was uh, intensely involved in the work looked them up at their homes, made a polite mm -hmm. visit in which I could say in my Japanese, which was limited, but I could say that I was uh, studying this problem from the standpoint of overcoming this issue, uh, getting rid of the atomic bomb, and uh, first understanding as fully as I could exactly what the bomb did to people in that city, uh, and then invited them to come 
see me in a very small office I had in the center of the city. Uh, it was a way of showing respect to them by paying my first visit to them. Uh, and it was also necessary to uh, separate myself from an official American group called the ABCC or Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, uh, which was uh, in charge of studying survivors physically, but uh, much to the uh, much to the anger of many Japanese survivors, uh, had no arrangements for any kind of therapy and was resented, even though people did go to the ABCC for that evaluation because of their concerns about their health. But the group was resented as looking upon Hiroshima uh, as a way of understanding the weapon in preparation for the next war or something like that. And I had to make clear that I was uh, unconnected with that group and that my purposes had to do with peace and uh, getting rid of the weapons. So uh, in, that, in that way, uh, uh, it was uh, the method, of course, uh, uh, there was also something else that happened that was important. Um, uh, I wrote a short piece that was published uh, in a fairly obscure American journal uh, about the Japanese peace symbol and how powerful it was and could be because of Japan's experience of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that article was translated into Japanese and run into the uh, weekly Asahi, which was a very widely read uh, national uh, weekly and uh, uh, people then could read and especially the more educated group uh, in Hiroshima could read the article and could understand uh, my purposes and my own approach to the whole issue and could make it known and that helped a great deal as well. I read at the beginning the statement from the mayor of Nagasaki and I know that these statements are released uh, by the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's a great tradition, actually, and those statements are fascinating to go back and read over time, but they they not only talk about the importance of the memory, but also the living activism. Um, the statement against, and not to forget that the world still has many thousands of nuclear weapons, and I wanted to turn with that in mind to your some of your activity uh, in the anti-nuclear movement, particularly with the international physicians for the prevention of of nuclear war, and again, sort of connect that back to your to your research with death in life. Did that? Did the physicians' movement grow out of the work you did with in death in life, or disconnected? Help us understand. No, that the physician the physicians' movement uh, had initiated itself before I did the study in Hiroshima, and uh, mm -hmm. I had the experience of while in Hiroshima reading an English language newspaper which described how doctors in New England were projecting the impact of a uh, nuclear weapon if it fell on Watertown Square in Boston. It was the early anticipation of Physicians for Social Responsibility which in turn gave rise to IPPNW, International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And of course I joined the group they were forming uh, as soon as I returned to the United States. Uh, but mm. once I was in the group, I was very active in speaking in this country and then in the internationalized version of the group uh, at, various, uh, at various cities uh, abroad. And I would always talk about Hiroshima, which by that time was a tiny, the use of a tiny nuclear weapon compared to the uh, right. hydrogen bombs that had been built and yet was the only more or less comprehensive record uh, we had of what happened to human beings in relation to a nuclear weapon. And in that sense, um, Hiroshima had been neglected in many ways and even in the anti-nuclear movement there uh, could be a certain neglect of the details of Hiroshima until I think I could bring my book, Death in Life, 
as a as a model and as a text. Mm. So I think it became an important text for the doctors' movement. Uh, after all, the doctors' movement had a very simple kind of uh, motive. It was sorry we won't be able to and won't be able to patch you up this time after this particular event should there be another nuclear war of any kind we'd like to we're physicians but the difficulty is all medical uh structures would be destroyed there'd be no place to work or to work from and moreover you would probably be dead and we would probably be dead so uh it was a very simple message and Hiroshima and my own presentation of it could extend that message into uh, what the bomb did to the minds of even those who survived it. And I could speak of what I came to uh, uh, describe as uh, from a split moment, a split second in time of exposure to the weapon, a survivor went through a lifelong immersion in death from the uh, original moment of sea of death around him or her and then the experience and witness of uh, bleeding into the skin, early signs of radiation, then the longer term effects of radiation, increased incidence of various cancers uh, and eventually many common cancers, and uh, even the fear of the effect to the next generation, as was at least possible. Uh, and then the identity of the Hibaksha could take on all of these death-related, uh, all these expressions of death anxiety from that initial moment of exposure to the weapon. And that was a message I tried to get across in my book. It, it strikes me as you bring these different pieces of it together, the power of an importance of the survivor narrative, but also the witnessing uh, the power of the physician to speak honestly about what they would be called to do in the nuclear and to basically testify that it's not possible, that it's, it's literally the conditions of discharging your job are impossible. and. I've been thinking about those in the context of our own time with COVID, and I want to just let people know you published a piece last week in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists with uh, Charles Strozier, who's also been on COVID calls. And just make that connection. Uh, I'm going to read a couple sentences of it here to set it up a little bit. But you and Chuck Strozier write that nuclear fear can be disseminated by the weapons themselves, by meltdowns in energy reactors, or by residual radiation effects in sites where the weapons were made or tested. Nuclear fear, you wrote, has become a model for large threats that endanger the human future. So when people encounter climate change or now COVID-19, they find themselves associating back to nuclear images. I, I think that's a really crucial framework that we need to be thinking about right now. Can you say a little more about the, about the piece and how you're thinking with this background of the nuclear as we look at COVID? Yes, um, <clears throat> the phrase, the, the uh, significant phrase here is that of what I came to call invisible contamination. Uh, in Hiroshima, it was the fear of invisible contamination that was lifelong, that was endless, and undoubtedly still exists in surviving uh, uh survivors of the first atomic bomb. And with COVID-19, there is a parallel fear of invisible contamination. Uh, the virus is everywhere and nowhere, nowhere that we can see it or recognize it, uh, perceive it, uh, but it is everywhere in its threat. And that of course brings about widespread death anxiety, not only in those who will a tested positive, test positive, but in all of us as potential victims of this invisible contamination. Uh, and I remember that uh, even though in Hiroshima there was no actual, uh, there was 
no actual contagion of radiation effects, there was almost a feel. There was a feeling that one almost did indeed have such contagion, so that people were wary of survivors when uh, Hiroshima was repopulated, so to speak, uh, from people from the outside, uh, and survivors could be looked upon as, in some ways, death tainted. This can be true of survivors of any extreme event, but was particularly true uh, with the extremity of Hiroshima. And uh, so that people behaved as though they were uh, survivors in Hiroshima were psychologically contagious. But then uh, where there is death anxiety and where there are bodily symptoms, uh, which can result in potentially fatal illness of one kind or another, physicians tend to be responded to more than politicians, unless those politicians are close to the view of physicians. And uh, certainly uh, with Hiroshima, there have been many, there have been a series of very prominent Japanese physicians who have become central figures uh, in that city because of what they offered in the way of help and understanding. Uh, and with COVID, as you know, uh, we've all come to realize that the, uh, the heroes of this uh, event are those on the front line of treating people and helping people, in this case, with risk to their own health because of the uh, extraordinarily contagious nature of this virus. So those were parallels. Now, the virus has, in a way, differed from uh, the uh, invisible contamination of Hiroshima because it has dislocated us more. Uh, with this universal death anxiety, uh, those who could have sought to flee to safer areas, uh, those are the privileged, uh, and others have had their work ended, uh, have been had their relations to family and friends cut off or interfered with by the necessity for social distancing. And there has been widespread paranoia in relation to contagion because any person mm -hmm. one knows or meets could be dangerous to one and one is similarly dangerous to others. So there are these differences, but then what you mentioned in your introduction to this article is very important. We made clear in the piece that nuclear threat has become the model for the most extreme kind of disaster. So that uh, even with 9-11, some people who were thought of Hiroshima or, or nuclear threat and with 19, uh, the background of nuclear threat, which has never left us, even though it's been less consciously active in recent years, that uh, experience of living in a world of nuclear threat is called forth and uh, there is that anxiety from nuclear threat as a model. Uh, the mind, in a way, uh, blending all extreme threats in a single way, and nuclear threat being the model for other such threats. I wonder, you know, as you think about you know some of the concepts even that you used in death and life like psychic numbing for example um do you see some some of that those concepts applicable today you talked about the invisible contamination that the with psychic numbing for example that the the reality of COVID 19 and, and living with the uncertainty of it and you said maybe even people not knowing if they had it or not, their own status is uncertain, that the stress of that is so much to bear that they they can't deal with it, they, they tamp it down, there's a there's an unreality to it that is is actually also dangerous to people. I, I'm wondering if you 
if you draw those connections or or you don't see those connections as clearly no those are those connections are very active uh, i came upon the idea or the concept of psychic numbing uh, as a defense mechanism uh, and came to define it as the inability or disinclination to feel and it's useful as a concept because it's simply based on feeling and non-feeling it can resemble other psychoanalytic defense mechanisms such as uh, repression or derealization or isolation but in this case feeling and not feeling is the only parameter of this mechanism and uh, in relation to disaster, some workable balance between feeling and non-feeling. A certain amount of psychic numbing uh, protects us from the full impact of, uh, of, of the disaster, and without it, uh, we would be unable to function in it. Uh, I spoke of uh, selective professional numbing uh, later on what I myself is way of uh, my interest were quite painful and demanding with survival there's widespread psychic uh, in connection with denial of its existence or its danger uh, or uh, of the crucial steps of wearing masks and uh, uh, and uh, carrying out constant social distancing in different ways and uh, in a way uh, one has helped the tone he's the psychic number in chief uh, because he uh, comes to epitomize denial, uh, falsification, uh, all of them related to psychic numbing uh, in the most dangerous coming ideas and discussions because of the present solid reality, self-contained reality has undoubtedly resulted in thousands and thousands of deaths. Uh, and in that way, President's combination of uh, uh, handling and um, falsification is at a level of criminality, in my view. I want to. Um just there was a little bit of, of lag on that last part of what you're saying there. So I want to make sure that we, we come back to just that you're talking about President Trump there and and that you referred to him because we lost just that part. But you used the phrase psychic number in chief. I'm, so I'm right that you're talking about Trump in this context. Is that right, Robert? I was indeed talking about Trump as the okay. number right. in chief or the agent. <laughs> the number of in chief. Uh, but and, but uh, let me I, I want to. Yeah, I want to come to Trump um, because you, you've you been, there was actually, it's a great, I tweeted out the link to it, it's a great interview you gave in Psychology Today, even in 2018, when you were wrestling with the question of what the responsibility is of psychologists um, to make observations about Trump. And so it's not like you've just raised this for the first time. Uh, you used a phrase in that interview that really struck me, that, that Trump was a purveyor of what you called malignant normality. Uh, already using a, a pandemic kind of term there, but you were, as usual, prescient, anticipating something in 2018 about malignancy there. Um, what's malignant normality and, and how is Trump traffic in it? I came to the idea of malignant normality through my work with Nazi doctors. Um, the Nazi regime created a reality in which the German doctor at the ramp in Auschwitz selecting Jews for the gas chamber was carrying out what was expected of him. He was doing his job. Uh, this was the 
malignant normality of Nazi Germany. But malignant normality is not limited to Nazi Germany. And we had our own and have our own version of malignant normality with the Trump administration. Malignant normality here includes lying, uh, uh, various forms of cruel behavior toward large segments of the population, identification with dictators and rejection of allies, and many, and of course, uh, enormous advantages to the rich and profound neglect of the poor and those who are afflicted. All of these are the malignant normality that Trump imposes, not just Trump, but his followers, who are a certain segment of American society, impose on American society. And it becomes necessary for us to overcome this malignant normality. And the phrase I came to uh, had to do with uh, witnessing professionals. We had to bear witness as professionals to the malignance of the normality. And we had certain forms of learning and experience in psychology in this case, and psychiatry that could enable us to uh, expose this malignant normality uh, in a Trump led America. And psychologists or psychiatrists like myself who spoke out were embracing the identity of witnessing professionals, uh, professionals who make use of the knowledge uh, that their profession has given them as a means of uh, serving their society uh, and, and exposing uh, ethical breakdown of the kind we have seen. And that's very different from a close hands-on diagnosis right. that one can make of a patient. It's rather a, a recognition from what the person has said, from his public statements, and from his behavior. Uh, it's uh, an interpretation of characteristics of dangerousness uh, that we from our psychiatric or psychological training can recognize and expose. And so that's been a considerable movement among psychologists and psychiatrists. And I think it's had a certain impact on the society. There's a continuity there that maybe is worth just reflecting on for a second that I wonder if you see Trump's behavior as significantly different from other presidents from uh, tr from Truman on up to the present, who undoubtedly have info you do see it as different. I mean, they certainly knew the nuclear threat was apocalyptic in scale, and yet they went forward building the nuclear complex. I'm curious how you how you distinguish because you were witnessing in those days too about the impossibility of of you know surviving uh, a global nuclear nuclear war, but you see this right in this moment where it now is somehow different. Well, um, just starting with all other presidents from Truman on, uh, uh, and even through Obama, um, there uh, has always been a conflict among presidents, American presidents, and Greg Mitchell and I wrote about this in our book, Hiroshima in America, uh, between, on the one hand, looking upon nuclear weapons as unusable just because of their extreme uh, uh, extremity and range of killing. And uh, on the other hand, looking upon them as weapons of war that might be resorted to under certain conditions. And even prior to Trump, the concept of deterrence has always been a highly misleading and dangerous one because when you look at the concept of deterrence, there is always uh, a potential willingness to use the weapons uh, should another country take steps that you consider, or leaders of a nuclear weapons possessing country consider dangerous to its own national security. So it's the uh, anticip anticipation of using the weapons and perhaps, perhaps uh, bringing about an end to the human future 
in the service of preventing certain behavior, even possibly use of the weapons on the part of an, another country. It's a very slippery and dangerous concept. With Trump, everything changes in a new way. Uh, I spoke in my writings of, I speak of my writings in, of Trump's um, uh, solipsistic approach to reality or solipsistic reality. Solipsistic meaning entirely self-contained, only uh, from the self and in relation to what the self needs and does. And that means uh, something that could not be more dangerous. If you look at all presidents, they work from a larger reality, and it can be uh, theoretical of a demo democracy being a, a better form of government as compared to dictatorship or reality about whether God exists or does not exist. Those are uh, changeable realities that uh, we all, in a sense, live by and draw upon. But there's also a distinction from that in the immediate, uh, immediate factual reality. I'm talking to Scott Knowles uh, about issues of Hiroshima and COVID-19, uh, and that's an immediate factual reality uh, as opposed to a more uh, theoretical reality. Trump violates the factual reality in favor of his solipsism, and that could mean his simply falsifying, uh, either telling lies in an awareness of violating reality, or also coming to believe in his own false reality or his own solipsistic reality, where it's not such, uh, it's not exactly a direct lie, but it is a falsification. Mm -hmm. And he can do that and is doing it in relation to nuclear weapons, sometimes seeming to recognize their power, other times speaking loosely about them, and certainly uh, behaving loosely in his interactions of Kim in uh, North Korea, uh, and being totally unreliable in connection with the fundamental issue of nuclear reality. I want to connect this with your thinking about climate change and uh, your book, The Climate Swerve. In you know, there's, there's, and I know you, uh, Naomi Oreskes has, uh, you know, you've collaborated with her. Certainly, she's been uh, part of the circle of discussion around Wellfleet for for years now. And I had a chance to teach Naomi and Eric Conway's um, book and film last week, two weeks ago, with students at Drexel. And, you know, the parallels there about the, the, the really stage-managed attack on scientific credibility, it is really stunning when you see it all assembled in one place. And I think, you know, she starts, they start their project with smoking, but I think one could certainly push the analysis back to, the, to nuclear radiation as well and bring it all the way forward to COVID, that we've lived in a long period of time now in which credibility around science and, and the battle to maintain that credibility um, is not just something of, about scientists maintaining their status in society. It has these real strong impacts on, on when a real disaster occurs. Do we have the basis of a shared worldview? Do we have the basis to take political action? It seems like we're harvesting the whirlwind right now with COVID-19, with these longstanding attacks so I know climate change is always something you're thinking about and writing about these days. Can, can you bring that into the discussion of COVID-19 a little bit and what you're thinking about it right now? Yes. Um, <clears throat> Naomi Oreskes has been, of course, a crucial figure in uh, making known the elements of denial and rejection of climate change. Uh, and right now, one way of looking at it is to say that uh, climate change is now recognized as actual uh, by a majority of Americans and a majority of people in the world. And in fact, part of what I wrote about uh, in the climate swerve was the encouraging uh, speed with which many, a majority, came to recognize the truth and causation of 
climate change. Uh, but at the same time, with climate change, as with COVID, we run up against a whole uh, theme in American society that's anti-elite, uh, anti-intellectual, and has lent itself to uh, conspiracy in ways that have existed long before Trump. Uh, and, and that's why the uh, historian Hofstetter could talk about the paranoid style in American politics, American political life. It's a paranoid style that has existed in American society uh, from uh, nativist, know-nothing mm -hmm. groups right through the president. And it's the deepest tragedy that um, we have a president and a following who embrace this style and carry it further uh, at the time of this genuinely world-threatening virus. Uh, and uh, that has led, of course, to large numbers of American deaths, much, much larger numbers uh, per capita of American deaths than anywhere else. Um, that has been true about climate change. And in a way, it was some of the same people as Oreskes demonstrated who denied um, uh, the, the harm of smoking, who did the same in relation to climate change. And now, if not the same people, actually the same kind of American uh, anti anti-elite thought uh, that is called into play and it's in a sense deepened and rendered more dangerous by Trump's denial of factual reality and by a solipsistic pattern that enables him to make up any kind of lie and put it mm -hmm. forward for the society to try to cope with. I would say that uh, COVID-19, in a way that has not been characteristic of climate change, uh, has uh, been a source of um, a source of defeat for Trump. Uh, he hasn't broken down, and he may or may not psychologically. We don't know, but his. A claim to control reality, uh, his claim to own reality has broken down because of the physicality, the organicity of illness and death, which can be demonstrated and is demonstrated uh, and is ever present for the American public. And in that sense, Trump's failings and uh, really uh, his criminality in relation to COVID-19 is recognized by much of the American population as it hadn't been before. This has to do with the insistent uh, presence of COVID-19, uh, its non-deniability, uh, and the place in which Trump finds himself uh, caught with uh, an expose of his falsehoods, as has not been the case until now. Of course, with sickness and uh, death, populations, as I said before, turn to physicians and to uh, scientists who seek some understanding and way of coping uh, with what is causing this, this wave of illness and death. And that's what's happening in American and other societies. It's at a terrible um, price. I want to remind people that you're listening to COVID calls in my discussion today with Robert J. Lifton about the nuclear and about climate change and bringing that into the, into the same discussion with COVID-19. Um, Robert, I, uh, and you can still get your questions in, by the way, We're, we still have a little more time to get your questions into YouTube live chat, or you can put them up on Twitter, just tag at US of Disaster. Um, Robert, I wanted to ask you, I, I've been uh, reached out to you early on in the COVID-19 um, pandemic in the United States, 
because I've been tracking, I've been wanting to track your own thinking about survivors. And um, I, I'd like to check in with you now on that. And, and what you're thinking is, you know, the, this pandemic is moving at a time scale, which is, uh, it's a temporality that's on, it's uncomfortable. Um, you know, usually in America, we deal with disasters as immediacies and we move into recovery quite quickly, or they're very slow, like nuclear threat or climate change. This one is a sort of medium temporality. We see it unfolding in time. We can imagine a possibility of an ending. And yet every day we're confronted with more bad news and, and the spread getting worse in the U.S., so we have survivors in the midst of a disaster. I, I wonder if you feel like you, you can say anything about it at this time, about your, your concerns about COVID-19 survivors, or is it just too early to say anything this time? Well, in my work, I did recognize and uh, develop a concept of uh, survivor meaning. And uh, one could see, for instance, with both survivors of Hiroshima or survivors of Auschwitz, uh, both of whom I interviewed extensively, one could uh, recognize in them special knowledge that was valuable to the world. And in both cases, groups of survivors traveled the world in conveying to people what they had been through. And that could be a form of what I called and others in similar ways, survivor wisdom. Uh, one wonders about that, of course, with COVID-19 survivors. But as you suggested, we're very much in the middle of it. And we don't know still enough about the condition to understand how these survivors will fare. Will they have permanent deficiencies? Uh, how will the long of the experience uh, be a factor with them? And there is the uh, also element of whether these survivors have uh, in them uh, antibodies that can be used or studied. Uh, it's um, not a moment when we can recognize any particular pattern in survivors or, or their capacity to tell their story in a way that affects the world uh, concerning our approach to COVID-19. But I do think we should continue to uh, observe survivors and of course be helpful to them in any way we can and to see how their survival affects their relation to society uh, and their voices and their impact on society. Uh, it, it's very much uh, in the middle of all this and too much uh, in, in a continuing immersion in it and a threat from it for us to recognize any clear patterns right now. I want to just come back to your piece with, with Chuck Strozier in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists last week because you make a turn in the piece, which I recognize now is sort of characteristic for you and, and for Chuck, which is you also offer hope and you offer possibilities for solidarity and overcoming. And in the piece, you say, with either threat, you're talking here about both the nuclear and COVID-19, we have no choice but to call upon the remarkable capacity of the human species for adaptation. Such adaptation is by no means passive and must combine political will with scientific knowledge. What kind of adaptation do you think is possible right now in the midst of this pandemic? The kind of adaptation that's needed is to do all we can to grasp the nature of the pandemic, uh, what, it, what it is, what it does, and to the best of our knowledge, how it spreads and how to limit that spread through medical and scientific uh, observation and inquiry and study. And that's been done in certain places. It's been done in fits uh, and starts uh, in this country, but it's ha it has uh, tragically lacked a central leadership. Uh, and uh, that can change with a change in the administration. 
uh, and we can bring to bear, so we said in the piece, and so I believe, we can bring to bear the mind's capacity to make use of logic, and in this case, scientific thought, to help contain what is profoundly dangerous to human survival. Uh, the point is, it's not beyond our capacity for this kind of adaptation, but it takes large-scale organization and self-control initiated from the top and carried on from below for it to be brought into play. That, to me, st strikes some resonance with your, your thinking in the, in the climate swerve about the need to take what is ultimately a very fragmentary experience and bring some, we will never have the whole of it. It's not possible for one community to experience a planetary thing, the same with the COVID, but somehow to reach a broader understanding, which then can become the basis of a politics. I, I've been wondering, and even as you're talking, if, if somehow coming out of COVID-19, it's possible that we'll even have a more aggressive stance on climate change. Do you, do you see the possibility for that? I've been called naive for saying that, so you're not going to hurt my feelings if you disagree, <laughs> but I wonder. No, I, I don't think it's naive. I think that um, with COVID, uh, people think of consciously or unconsciously uh, the entire human habitat as being endangered, and that's what climate change is about. So although they're different issues, they merge, and they certainly can merge in human minds. And in my book on climate change, The Climate Swerve, I talked about the human accomplishment of widespread grasp of the truths of climate change, but sadly, without the full political will to carry them through. Uh, and the threat to the human future posed by COVID-19 could, yes, uh, feed back to climate change uh, in, in relation to which there is already a spreading recognition of its full danger. And climate change, after all, is the ultimate container of all that threatens humankind. Even nuclear war is uh, a, de a destruction of the human habitat and nuclear winter would be the most uh, lethal uh, form of climate change, one could say. So we must, in a way, and we do to some extent and can to a greater extent, uh, energize our approach to climate change uh, via our coping with the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Robert, there's never a time that I talk with you that I don't come away uh, knowing more and also somehow feeling a greater resolve to stay with this work. Uh, thank you so much for everything you do and for making time for this conversation and for that piece that you wrote with Chuck last week, tremendous, and I hope you'll keep writing about COVID-19 as we go forward with this pandemic. It's not going to be over anytime real soon. So I expect you have some things in the works more to say on it. Am I right? Yes, I'm working on things and hope to have more to say about it. Uh, I want to I'm remind trying. everybody, you've been, list, you've been listening to COVID calls, and tomorrow on COVID calls, 5 o'clock Eastern time, I'm going to talk about the pandemic in Haiti and the Caribbean with Francisca Lucien and Mimi Scheller. So be sure to join us then and every Monday through Friday, 5 o'clock Eastern time. A great 101st COVID calls discussion. Robert J. Lifton, stay healthy, and I hope we're together in the same room soon. I do. Thanks, Scott. Stay healthy, everybody. See you tomorrow, 5 o'clock.